Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and good evening to all our listeners. It's just after 10 o'clock this Tuesday evening, the 8th of June 2010. You're listening to You Classified on 93.5 Unity FM, Heart of the City, Birmingham, and the surrounding areas. If you're also listening to us on the internet uh, throughout the world, well, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to you all as well. www.unityfm.net. And to uh, all our listeners of Birmingham, uh, it's been a quite a miserable day today, actually, raining, wet, and then we had a bit of sunshine anyway. I want to actually say a couple of things before we continue uh, with the You Classified uh, unfortunately we are unable to get hold of uh, Gerald Kaufman and Alexander Barron hopefully uh, if we can't get them on today they will be um, here next week on uh, next week's show uh, we still have Brother Dawood with us we're going to be discussing uh, the up and coming budget on the 22nd of June and now we're going to touch on the uh, new legislation that's been uh, passed through the European Union last night however, however moving away from all this to uh, give you boys, girls, ladies, and gentlemen all a chance to, um, well, I'm not going to say, but I'm going to introduce a man who's going to say it, and it's the uh, presenter of Sunday Slam. Everyone on board, welcome Rob Bladley with a special announcement. Oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to make a quick announcement. Uh, Sunday Slam this Sunday between 7 and 8 o'clock to, uh, with me and Tariq Ziad. We have a, 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 pro, uh, a competition and the prize is an excellent one. The prize is a ticket to go and watch uh, Frontier Wrestling Alliance, which is a British wrestling uh, federation in Nottingham. It's for the art of war. So if you want to tune in Sunday between those times or texting, I think it's going to be a, a text-only competition. Honestly, it's a great prize to see the up-and-coming future of uh, world wrestling as well. There's guys like Doug Williams, who's actually a TNA X Division champion. So please tune in and also enjoy the show tonight, which is always great. Thank you very much, boys. Thank you very much, ladies and gents. Well, Thanks thank you. Much, thank you very Thanks much, Robbie. For that. Do join me and Rob on Sunday, 7 to 8 p.m., where we will be giving away a ticket for Frontier Wrestling Alliance events in Nottingham on the 20th of June. It's uh, uh, 18 only, over 18, so, so we don't want any younger viewers. For anyone over 18, uh, you can enter the competition with Tarek and Rob this Sunday. I tell you, it's a fantastic uh, offer. You know what I might do? I might actually use a, a voice-changing application to actually disguise my voice, and uh, I might enter the competition myself. Who knows? Huh. No, of course I won't do that. So but that's Sunday, 7 to 8 p.m., Sunday Slam. Tune if you in. you pick up a free ticket, call in, and, uh, well, it won't be a call. It's going to be a text uh, text only competition this one the winning ready. text will be picked on the following you classified so on the 15th of June tune in for that so I shall get my uh, big hat and uh, put all your names and I shall close my eyes and pick a name just like they usually do think of it's the lottery as long as they pull out a rabbit well no exactly exactly fantastic I like that one Tarek cheesy but you know it was good it was good um, I'd like to actually give a couple of mention uh, to a couple of our listeners uh Prashant Singh, I'd like to say a big hello to him. He's listening in uh, from uh, some part of Birmingham. And also uh, from Hereford uh, to Mr. Neil. You know who you are if you're listening. A big hello to you as well. Now, let's return to our uh, subject. And well, text it aside. Well, okay, we got uh, text as well. Text is salams. Can I have that chapter quoted by the gentleman from the Old Testament? Jazakallah khair. I don't know who sent it, but I'm um, sure we'll see what we can do there. Well, if you'd like to call in, uh, call on if you um, want to uh, come on and uh, make a point, or if you want to give us your name. And obviously that chapter, uh, I think Brother Dawood actually yeah, I quoted. I can give it you now. It's Jeremiah. That's Jeremiah. Uh, verse, uh, it's chapter 29, verses 17 to 30. So that's chapter 29, Jeremiah. It's, chap- it's Jeremiah. Chapter 29, verses 17 to 30. 30. Well, there you are. I hope that answered your question, caller, uh, texter. Um, please, guys, if you're going to send in text, um, always... And the Quran, the Quranic b- b- part was Surah 17, Al-Isra, uh, verse 1 to 8. Well, thanks, Abel Dao. And also, um, getting back to our conversation, we've talked about Israel in the first half, and there's a few things... The G20 is coming up in Canada very soon. And, uh, yeah. <clears throat> all this is quite significant, basically, because uh, on, a, on the wings of the Bilderberg meeting, which is taking place in CIG, Spain this week, yeah. will be the G20 where world leaders are going to meet. And the word is that also they're going to call for big cuts in the public spending yeah. throughout the Eurozone as well. There's going to be very, very heavy police. It'd be interesting to go into Canada itself and have a look at the leader of Canada, the current Prime Minister of Canada, Mr. Stephen Harper. Yes. And the role that he plays in this whole 
Um, this whole Israel thing, Bilderberg, etc. He has quite a pivotal, pivotal role in, in a way himself. I mean, some of the things that I can quote off the top of my head, I haven't got the information in front of me, is he was the man that, um, with George Bush, was going to form the North American Union, basically, form an alliance, if you like, as well, where Mexico, Canada, and America, the United States, are proposed to be joined into a big super state. That was on the cards as well. And yeah. That's one of the things he's famous for as well. I believe he is a pro-Zionist as well. Um, somebody who's very in with the banks. In fact, one of the first things he did when he became Prime Minister of Canada was to declare ha ha Hamas a terrorist organization and therefore stop humanitarian funding from Canada going to Gaza and the people of Palestine. But perhaps you can tell us a bit more. Well, uh, I, I've lived in Canada. My, my sister-in-law is currently here from Canada and uh, uh, I, I've lived there. But what, uh, before coming to the G20, I just wanted to give this, this information about um, uh, the, the expulsion of Jews from, from over the past thousand years uh, in Europe. And these were the, uh, it's relevant because it's uh, when the, the brother was on earlier was saying, uh, you know the, 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 uh, that um, uh, it's not it's not to do with uh, with it's only a small group, but there are uh, in Russia in just in Europe and Russia alone, the Jews have been banished 47 times in the last thousand years, and so we, we, in in Maine, uh, Maine, France, Upper Bavaria, England, Fra uh, Saxony, Hungary, Belgium, Slovakia, Austria, uh, Lyon, the city, Cologne. Uh, Aug uh, Augustburg, uh, Bavaria, Netherlands, Brandenburg, uh, the list goes on to 47. And uh, it's very, very important that, um, uh, that, uh, that we look at what uh, the observations of Jewish scholars have been to find out why people like Noam Chomsky. Uh, and, uh, uh, but Bernard Lazar's book, now this is from 1894, and I'm going to read this, and then we'll come back to the, the issue of the G20. Uh, Lazer is called the Antisemitism, the History of, published in 1894. He said, if the hostility, even aversion, had only been shown towards the Jews at one period and in one country, it would be easy to unravel the limited ca causes of this anger. But this race has been, on the contrary, an object of hatred to all the peoples amongst whom it has been established itself. It must be therefore, since the enemies of the Jews belong to the most diverse races, since they lived in countries very distant from each other, since they were ruled by very different laws, governed by opposite principles, since they had neither the same morals nor the same customs, and since they were animated by unlike dispositions, which did not permit them to judge of anything in the same way, it must therefore we concluded that the general cause of anti-Semitism has always resided in Israel itself and not in those who have fought against Israel. And this is, uh, and, the, and it's followed on in the American Hebrew a little later, uh, in which uh, uh, the, the, the same observation can hardly be an accident that, that antagonism directed against Jews is to be found pretty much everywhere in the world where Jews and non-Jews are associated. As, and as the Jews are condemned at the common elements of the situation, it would seem probable on the face of it <clears throat> that the causes will be found in them rather than the widely varying groups which feel this antagonism. And hence, why the, where the, when Allah says in the Bible, he will send, uh, send them uh, to, uh, all over the world to be a curse and a hissing and a booing, then and a reproach, it's the proof that that curse is on them and it's on them still as we speak now, and it's going to come in the final, uh, the final resolution of it all. So um, that's uh, that's something to to for people to ponder that uh, that uh, Allah in the Bible and in the, in the Quran is warned them, and they have basically nothing to come because they are soaking up the furnace for for their own destruction. Um, and uh, the, the, there is another, the, there's another reference, if any, any of the brothers want to look, in Ezekiel uh, 22 and 12. This is what uh, the Old Testament, Allah is saying in the Old Testament. In thee have they taken gifts to shed blood. Thou hast taken usury and increase, and thou hast greedily gained of thy neighbors by extortion. 
and hath forgotten me, saith the Lord God. Therefore, behold, I beat my fist at the dishonest profit you have made, and at the bloodshed which hath been in the, in the midst of thee. Can your heart endure, or can your hand remain strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? I, the Lord, have spoken it and will do it. And I will scatter thee among the heathen and disperse thee throughout the country and will consume your filthiness out of you. You shall defile yourselves again in the sight of all the nations. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. The word of the Lord came to me saying, O son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. They are all bronze, tin, lead, and iron in the midst of the furnace. They may come dross from, become dross and silver. Therefore, said the Lord God, because you have all become dross, therefore, behold, I gather you in the midst of Jerusalem, as men gather silver, bronze, lead, and tin in the midst of a furnace, to blow fire on it and melt it. So I will gather you in my anger and my fury, and will leave you there and melt you. Now that's what's coming, and, uh, and that's what they have failed miserably to realize. This, the final solution is going to be at their own hands in the land they claim to be theirs. So, uh, apart from that, uh, nothing much to report. Uh, right, to the G20. Just um, before you do, sorry? there's something that came to my mind whilst you were talking as well, is that you know that they always quote a particular verse of the Bible, I think it's Deuteronomy, I'm not sure about, you know, God gave you the land of Israel, basically. No, it, prom it was, uh, this is a, 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 a falsehood, and also it is promised to all the children of Abraham, not just to them. Because there's also a clause in other biblical verses as well, that's the key thing, isn't it? They quote one verse, in reality there's several verses in which there is a clause very similar to the clause mentioned in the Quran, about also holding on to the covenant. Yes, yeah, so the covenant is what they have failed to realize. You cannot but you cannot be in the Holy Land and doing unholy things. You cannot manufacture armaments, weapons of mass destruction, and and uh, and uh, uh, destroy your neighbours. This is contrary to the covenant. So they are the Antichrist, the anti-God forces, and they, as Ben Gurion said, he didn't believe in God. He thought God believed in him, as did Golda Meir. These are atheists of the worst order. There is actually a famous incident, it's something which I've heard, that um, a group of uh, people during the, the Holocaust of Germany actually um, decided to hold a court, basically. The person they were going to try in this court was God. Now, what happened was, basically, you had the, uh, the more intelligent, kind of senior rabbi-type people, and you had a very simple Jew. So the simple Jew, they put him on trial, and he was to represent God, basically. And the charge was, had we, or had, had God, done injustice to the people of, of you know, Israel? Yeah. Now, this very simple man also couldn't defend himself. Now, they'd actually performed their morning prayer in the synagogue. Then they held this court. And in the end, just close, close to the evening prayer, they declared God to be guilty. And they went, they went and performed their evening prayer straight afterwards. Well, look, the, the meeting of the, if you, you, you must get a book called Jewish History, Jewish Religion by Israel Shahak, The Way to 3,000 Years. A fantastic book. And then, therefore, when they go in the synagogue, only nine out of ten uh, of the, of the worshippers will be actually, only one out of the ten will be worshipping God, Adonai, Allah, Allah. Uh, the, the other nine out of the ten will be propitiating Satan because they fear him more than they fear God. And uh, the, if I may come in, Brother Dawood, yes. and thank you very much, if you can hold on to that point. Um, as uh, I have promised earlier, that uh, we have got our guest, uh, guest number two joining us now, Alex Harrison, from the Flotilla Convoy. Uh, and she's going to be able to give us some of the experiences um, that uh, she experienced last week or and in a couple of the convoys she's been on, uh, carrying aid relief to the Gaza Strip. Alex uh, is now joining us. Good evening, and uh, welcome to Unity FM 93.5. Good evening. Now, Alex, I mean, we've seen our television pictures um, of what we can get in this uh, country with the media coverage, and we have had also heard the reports uh, of the uh, invasion by the IDF of those uh, ships. What can you tell us? What actually well, took place? Um, 
I was aboard the flotilla. I was aboard a small ship called the Samud that was next to the Mavi Marmara. And I'm sure we've all heard over the week about the, the nine deaths on the Marmara and the, the violence meted out by the Israeli forces on the Marmara. And I think I'd like to begin by uh, refuting the Israeli suggestions that what happened on the Marmara was somehow uh, as a result of the response of the passengers on the Marmara and that there was no violence elsewhere. That's simply not true. Uh, I witnessed, as the boat nearest, we witnessed the beginning of the attack on the Marmara, and all six ships in the flotilla were attacked and boarded and hijacked with Israeli violence. I was on a very small boat um, carrying 17 passengers, mostly women, and after the Marmara's attack, they came for us, and uh, the women stood on the open decks of our small yacht, uh, resisting only by putting their bodies in the way with, with no other implement in their hands. And as the soldiers, uh, these armed masked men, came to board our boat, before they even got on the boat, they threw sound bombs and they opened fire with rubber bullets and with uh, paintballs at very close range. Uh, one woman was uh, injured badly in, in the face. Her nose was broken and burnt when a sound bomb went off. Uh, the Israelis stormed our boat, um, broke all the glass, tackled all the women to the floor, clipped them with cable ties behind their backs, and two of the women were hooded. Uh, the professional journalists on board, two Australian uh, internationally known journalists, were greeted amazingly by three Australian Israeli soldiers who recognized them and nonetheless tasered them. Now, so it's, I absolutely refute the suggestion that uh, what happened on the Marmara was uh, something exceptional. The Israelis treated us all with violence. Uh, the only reason that there weren't deaths on other boats is that, that we were smaller and, and, and they took control of us, us faster. The Israeli behavior uh, to the whole mission was violent and filled with hate and derision from beginning to end. And this treatment didn't stop at the end of the military uh, operation to take our boat. This kind of treatment went on right until the moment that uh, we were forced to be deported. I don't want to keep bringing this up because I'm sure you've had to say this so many times, but approximately 20 people lost their lives tragically. There were nine people lost their lives on the Marmara. We still have some passengers unaccounted for, and we still have some passengers who are critically ill in hospital. But at this point, nine uh, Turkish citizens sacrificed their lives, one of whom was also a, a dual uh, Turkish-American national. Now, could you tell us a little bit about these people, their occupations, what you know, what they did in their day-to-day -day life? Well, uh, most of them were men over 40. Some of them worked for the IHH, which is a, a Turkish aid organization. Uh, great diversity of people. One was a firefighter. Uh, the the um, American national who was killed was a 19-year-old scholar. He'd actually got American citizenship. Um, he was Turkish by birth. He'd got an American citizenship when he got a, a scholarship to go and study in the U.S. He was a brilliant young scholar. I'd say we, there was a great diversity of backgrounds. Uh, not just among the nine who, ki who were killed, um, but amongst the passengers in general. We weren't just Muslims or just leftist activists. We, we were people who came at it from a political point of view, people who came from an aid and humanitarian point of view, people there for religious reasons, and people there just out of concern for Palestine. Is it correct that there was actually a Holocaust survivor travelling with you? Uh, Hedy Epstein was uh, due to be on the boat. Um, unfortunately... Um, the Cypriot authorities, who have previously supported our mission, uh, this time, I feel, succumbed to the uh, immense pressure that Israel had put them under and at the last minute declined to let us board any passengers in Cyprus. So although she desperately wanted to be part of the mission and she was on the shore waiting to join the boat, Hedy Epstein couldn't come with us this time. But she has, uh, she has participated in other missions. What can you, uh, Rachel, tell us... Um about when because we have heard that the the people on board of those uh, ships that was invaded by the IDF uh, people actually challenged and used clubs and other weapons to actually attack the Israeli soldiers with the intention of well, killing Israeli yes, soldiers mean, this, this is ultra intelligence the Israelis have been saying that we attacked them now we, 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 we were on six boats bobbing around in the middle of the Mediterranean including a yacht a ferry and a cruise ship so there we were in the middle of the Mediterranean, 100 miles from anywhere, very much in international waters, on our pleasure craft. 
and apparently we, the Israelis are claiming that we attacked them. It's utterly ridiculous. You have to then say, well, what on earth were your soldiers doing amongst our flotilla? Now, I know there has been some footage, some selective footage in the Israeli hands released showing our passengers with room handles uh, and, and other things they found. Now, you have to remember, <laughs> they were boarded by force by armed, masked men coming at them from helicopters and from warships and from Zodiac speedboats. They were the aggressors, and they came in firing with, with, with rubber bullets, um, percussion grenades, and also live fire. Now, I'm, I'm a non-violent person, and when they came for our, our boat, as a, a fairly slightly built woman, I didn't uh, feel that I could offer any kind of physical resistance other than stand in their way. But uh, I quite sympathise with the young men who picked up whatever came to hand on the boat. And the way I see it is uh, if I was driving along country lane mm. uh, at night in a similarly isolated situation to the way we were on the boat, you know, at, at sea in the dark, if somebody came crashing through my windscreen, masked and armed, I would pick up whatever I found in the car to try to defend myself. Abs and absolutely. I think that was the situation of the young men on the uh, Marmara who, who tried to defend themselves. And it was an act of defense. However you look at it legally, we were in international waters on a, on a Turkish boat. This was a crime against peace. This was an act of war against the Turkish. The men were on our boat. They were simply defending themselves. I, I mean, it's like I say, I mean, Israelis have reported that the, uh, the crew uh, or the passengers on those uh, boats, the Marmara and the other ships, had all intention of killing Israeli soldiers. I mean, forgive me, but uh, you cannot uh, kill someone with a broomstick unless you really, really go for them. Well, again, I mean, it's ridiculous. If we had had any serious intent, if there had been any serious contingent on the boat with serious intention to harm soldiers, you'd think with 500 people on that boat, there would have been a serious injury to a soldier that had been death to a soldier. What actually happened was that nine of our passengers were killed, 40 more uh, sorry, 50 more were shot and there were many other injuries. If we were the violent ones, why are the injuries all on our, and deaths all on our side? So did, well, at any stages, the Marmara or the other co uh, ship in the convoy uh, defied Israeli warnings because they should, before they opened fire, they actually um, gave a warning to the ships to actually stop and surrender? Well, they had given vague warnings for several hours on the radio, but they never warned us that they were going to attack us with violence. What they had said was quite vaguely, um, you are approaching a blockaded area, turn back immediately, your, the responsibility of your actions will be on the passengers and crew. Now, that's faintly ridiculous. We, wouldn't, we were in the middle of the Mediterranean. We were nowhere near their blockaded area. And of course, we don't recognize their blockade. It's illegal and it's illegitimate. Um, and it's, it's quite simply wrong. So we just replied, negative, we're, we're carrying on to Gaza. But they'd never warned us specifically that they were going to board our boats by force or open life fire. What and of course, there was absolutely no need for them to do that. We didn't... Uh, we, we had considered all the possible scenarios, and this was one that we'd considered, but it, it wasn't one that I thought was likely. I thought if they stopped us that they would simply force us back. I didn't seriously uh, expect them to open live fire on us, although dealing with the Israelis, you always have to consider that possibility. Yes, uh, unfortunate though that may, it may be. Uh, yes. What were your consignments on this? What, I mean, you were carrying materials, um, you know, construction material and things like that. Was uh, it, was the cargo? It, yeah, the cargo on the boats. I mean, there were, I believe, construction materials and uh, uh, food and medical aid. And Yes, I mean, we, we, we're carrying things that we say are on Israel, Israel's band list. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say they're not on Israel's permitted list because Israel only has a, a very short list, uh, a shopping basket full of items that it permits into the Gaza Strip. We were carrying cement from re for reconstruction, which hasn't been allowed in since the, the massacres in Gaza um, last year. Uh, basic construction materials, symbolic gifts of olive oil, medicine, medical equipment, educational materials, sports equipment and toys. And by educational materials... I include things like pens and paper. There is a paper shortage in Gaza. Israel doesn't allow paper to be transferred into Gaza. I mean, this is, this is apparently a, a dangerous terrorist weapon that, uh, that, that Palestinians mustn't be allowed access to. Paper and pens. 
Um, Alex, if we could keep you just for five five minutes or so after the break, we'll sure. do a commercial break. We also have with us uh, uh, brother Dawood Musa Pidcock. Um, right. He's also on the line, and uh, we've been talking to him for the last half hour, uh, last hour and a half or so. But if we could keep you on, um, and uh, we would like to talk to you about the Rachel Curry that was actually uh, taken, okay. also by the Israelis. Um, so if you could stay with us, that would be uh, great. And um, we'll talk to you after the break. Okay. Well, uh, as I say, uh, we are due a commercial break um, on 93.5 Unity FM. You're listening to You Classified. Uh, you've been listening for the last hour and a half uh, with myself, Tarisi Aran, Dawood Pidcock, uh, who's a uh, resident guest on You Classified um, every fortnightly. Um, he kindly gives up his time and uh, comes on to the show with us and... Um, well, we do always have uh, interesting discussions. Uh, we will continue uh, for the next five minutes or so after the break. Uh-huh. 